Questions without notice. Senator Hill. Mr President, my question is directed to Senator Evans, representing the Prime Minister. Remind the Minister that Labor Party President and Member for Laylor Barry Jones has had the guts to admit that there was not a secret deal between Mr Howard and Mr Packer over changes to cross-media rules. Now that Mr Jones has confirmed that there was no deal, Order. why shouldn't Mr Keating be brought to account for his lies and attempted character assassination and forced to resign? Why shouldn't the same standards be applied to Mr Keating as he would seek to apply to others? The order. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Evans. Well, Mr President, Mr Jones also had the good sense to acknowledge he didn't know what he was talking about on that or indeed anything else that he opened his mouth about in that uh, order. unfortunate interview on Sunday. The truth of the matter is that Mr Jones is not in a position to know. Mr Jones is not in a position to know what Order. the nature of any information that was held privily by the Prime Minister might be about this extremely sensitive matter. And the truth of the matter is, as I have said on innumerable occasions, the evidence for that belief on the part of the Prime Minister does not need anything more than the public record to substantiate it. A public record which amply demonstrates that save and except for that little time in 1991 when Mr Howard was doing a deal of a different kind with another media proprietor, there has been absolute consistency of approach on the part of Mr Howard about his belief that the present cross-media rules are inadequate, inappropriate, in need of review, in need of amendment. There is also on the public record a very clear statement by Mr Howard and various of his acolytes about the necessity for the Trade Practices Act to possibly have a role in that particular area as the appropriate way of dealing with any monopolisation that might exist. There is also on the public record, however, clear statements from the Trade Practices Commissioner, Professor Fells, that the Trade Practices Act has no such potential application because you're talking about different markets. You've also had on the public record an absolute unwillingness on the part of Mr Howard over and over again to respond to specific questions about what the nature of his policy commitments will be, what he will do in fact, in practice, and you've had a failure to produce any such policy, of course, and there will continue to be such a failure all the way through until the next election. You're talking about someone here on the opposition side without any shred of credibility at all on that particular issue, and the government's case stands very firmly in the way in which it's been put. Supplementary, Senator Hill. Uh, well, Mr President, uh, for his honesty, Barry Jones has now been bucketed by the minister in the, in the Senate. Uh, some sense of loyalty to his party president, I would, have, uh, I would have thought, whilst the minister continues this farce of arguing that the evidence for a secret deal, the secret evidence for a secret deal, is in fact on the public record. What are these extra matters that you say that the Prime Minister holds privily? What, are, what is this extra evidence that we don't know of? And if he is not prepared to put up that evidence, why shouldn't we assume, as did Barry Jones, that he in fact lied to the Australian people, and why shouldn't he resign? Yeah. The Minister, Senator Evans. The President of the ALP, Barry Jones, made no such assumption and no such statement. He just expressed his own rather idiosyncratic view uh, of the circumstances of the particular occasion, not a view that was conceivably based on any information Order. at all. The situation is as I have described. But we're not in a position. We're not in a position. Mr. Keating's not in a position. Mr. Lee's not in a position. And I'm not in a position, obviously, to disclose sources that don't want to reveal themselves. But you don't need sources to make the point. You don't need sources to make the point that what we have on the opposition side is a squalid willingness to trade in a way that is seen by the opposition as politically advantageous and beneficial. That's what we've got on the other side of politics, and you ought to be ashamed of that. You ought to be ashamed of your utter incapacity and unwillingness to be frank and honest with the Australian people about what your media policy is. What your media policy is that is one that would clearly accommodate a major proprietor in print having a major interest in a major television the network in the same city. The That's what you've said and you haven't denied it. Order. I draw the attention of order. I draw the attention of honourable senators to the presence in the President's Gallery of a parliamentary delegation from the Russian State Duma, led by the Deputy Chairman of the State Duma, Mr Alexander Venjarovsky. On behalf of honourable senators, I have pleasure in welcoming you to the Senate and trust that your visit will be both informative and enjoyable. Yeah. Senator Kearney. Mr. Uh, President, Mr. President, my question is directed to the uh, Leader of the Government in the Senate, Senator Evans. 
Could you tell us what are the implications of the High Court decision last week for the future of the native title legislation? What is the government's reaction to the statement by the Western Australian Premier that he will continue to fight against that legislation? And will the government accept the opposition leader's proposal to make the legislation more workable? Oh, good question. The leader of the government of the Senate, Senator Evans. <laughs> Mr. President, the High Court decision on Marbo and the Native Title Act is a complete and absolute vindication of the stance that the Commonwealth government has taken on the constitutionality of our legislation, as well as, of course, on the principles of justice which underlie that legislation. It's now open for the West Australian government to come on board and to cooperate, as other states and territories are doing, in putting together a sensible and equitable regime for providing justice to Aboriginal Australians for the first time. The Commonwealth is certainly concerned about the uncertainty relating to the new titles issued in WA since 93. Premier Court has deliberately ignored the processes that were set down in the Native Title Act, and he has to take ultimate responsibility for the effect of his decision in WA. He has to take responsibility for the waste of at least $4 million of taxpayers' money, and he has to take responsibility for the uncertainty that now surrounds some thousands of titles that have been issued since 1993. The Order. uncertainty, such as it is in WA, is wholly of that state government's doing, and it's up to them now to decide how best to fix the mess that they've created. We are nevertheless prepared to work with the West Australian Government to ensure that issues arising from this decision can be addressed cooperatively. <coughs> Preliminary talks have already been held at ministerial level with the court government, and further discussion at both officials and ministerial level will obviously be needed. Mr Howard tells us that the Act needs to be made more workable. He hasn't given us any information as to about the respects in which it needs to be made war workable, except to say that he's going to respond appropriately to the responsibilities and the, uh, the interests of the states in this respect. Not a word about the interests of those who the legislation is entitled Order. is designed to assist. Not a word about anything other than the state interests, and that's typical. We don't know what in detail the prescription is going to be because there was not a word said about this in the otherwise extremely lengthy statement on a whole variety of policy issues that was made by Mr Howard to the Liberal State Conference over the weekend. This is not an issue on which he feels comfortable, and that's perfectly obvious the reason why. We've got no doubt at all that the Native Title Act is perfectly workable in its present form, and that Mr Howard's reference, as Michael Lavache said over the weekend, is simply code for gutting and filleting this legislation, as the opposition wanted to do with the Land Fund Act. Perhaps he's going to get Richard Court to draft the legislative amendments for him. We've always said that we'd see how the provisions of the Act operate before we consider the, any question of amendment, as is normal practice for legislation. It's only been in operation for a year. We won't compromise any of the principles in the Act, which does represent an appropriate balance between competing interests. Any amendments that we make will go only to improving procedures under the Act and won't affect the spirit of the law. Nor will we accept, Mr President, any prescription from the opposition that goes to the spirit of this law or anything else that we've been doing so far as Aboriginal legislation and social justice programs are concerned. The heart of this legislation is the spirit that we understand to be at issue here so far as Aboriginal people is concerned. And I can understand, Senator Hill, you don't want to talk about Aboriginal people's interests because you simply don't understand them. You didn't understand Order, them when you took your opposition the chair, to the Mabo legislation. You didn't understand the Senator issues Evans. at stake here when you played the role that you did in opposing the land fund legislation, and you certainly didn't understand the sensitivities that are involved for Aboriginal people when you took the position that you did, and Mr Howard continues to support him every inch of the way in taking the position that you did, the squalid and tawdry position that you did on the Hindmarsh Aboriginal Documents Affair. You have had three major opportunities to get it right so far as Aboriginal affairs over the last year is concerned, with Mabo, with the Land Fund and with Hindmarsh. <coughs> and on every one of these occasions you have been wrong Order, and three Senator strikes Hill. and you are out. Three strikes and you are out. You have demonstrated an absolute unwillingness and an unwillingness to acknowledge the nature of the issues that are here involved. <coughs> I contrast the, the minister's time has expired. <coughs> with that of the CRA. <coughs> Senator Short. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is also to the Leader of the Government of the Senate, to Senator Evans. I hope he will at least attempt to be a bit more honest in his answer uh, the, to this one than, than he was in his previous Order. answer to Senator Hill. I refer to the uh, sudden sharp fall in the value of the Australian dollar against the United States dollar and the trade weighted index, which includes most other currencies, uh, including the Japanese yen, against which we have now reached a record low. Uh, has the merchant, uh, US merchant bank Goldman Sachs compared the Australian economy with the Mexican economy, 
and predicted a further large fall in the value of the dollar because of the blowout of the current account deficit expected in the next six months and the government's inability to deliver on its responsible fiscal uh, policy. Does the plummeting value Order, in Senator the dollar and a continuing concern about its prospects greatly increase the likelihood of further interest Senator rate hikes Cook. and tax increases once the New South Wales election is out of the way? Or will you categorically Senators, rule out expired. these increases in interest rates and taxes? The Leader of the Government of the Senate, Senator Evans. Through the chair, if you would, Mr. Uh, President, we're not in the business, as Senator McMullen says, of trawling around every second rate commentator trying to find skerricks of commentary that drag this country down. We are proud of the economic performance of this country. We're proud of the capacity for sustainable growth that we've now introduced in this country. We're proud of the achievement that we've made so far as employment is concerned, Senator with Kemp. more than 500,000 jobs having Senator been created Kemp. over the last two years, as compared with a promise to do it over three years, and that performance is there on the public record. I'm not going to comment specifically about the dollar. We never do. I am obviously prepared to concede that the current account deficit at the moment is higher than any of us find comfortable. What I am also saying, however, is what this government has been saying since day one, is that the government is committed to a significant tightening of fiscal policy in the May budget in order to boost national saving and, as a result, reduce Australia's call on overseas capital. That is the way in which we are going to address the problem of the current account deficit. That will be there for all to see when it comes to this budget in just a few weeks' time. The growth that is there in the Australian economy is perfectly sustainable when you take into account the enormously strong productivity performance that this, that this economy has accumulated. It's sustainable when you take into account the extraordinarily low rates of inflation that we have managed to be able to hang on to for three years in a row with inflation headline rates now running at around 2.5 per cent. This is an absolutely extraordinary achievement, not one that's been seen for decades in this country. It's a proud record. The economy is in good shape and there's no need to act in any other way. The, notion, the nonsensical notion that uh, somehow interest rate uh, strategy is being governed or directed or somehow influenced by current political events utterly fails to acknowledge the reality that the government doesn't single-handedly control interest rates, even if we were irresponsible enough to want to behave in that way. That is a function of the Reserve Bank's decision-making authority in consultation, yes, with the government, but in its own authority and based on its own sense of monetary responsibility. To make that accusation of the kind that you continue to make, have been making over the last few days and weeks, is to demonstrate an, demonstrate an absolute contemptuous lack of respect for the credibility of the Reserve Bank, those people who make up the board. The point of the matter is that we have a responsible monetary policy. We are determined to put the primary weight of the economic adjustments that are necessary on fiscal policy for the reasons that I have explained, and we do have a sustainable deficit target that will in fact be reached as a result of that budgetary process. Senator Short, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, in view of that uh, totally equivocal non-answer, I, uh, I ask you uh, just how soon after the New South Wales election will the interest rate hike occur and the increased tax proposals be announced? Will it, will, it be, uh, will it be late March, or will it be April, or will you perhaps wait until May? To the Minister, Senator Evans. To ask that question is to demonstrate exactly the kind of irresponsibility Mr. President, has kept this mob out of government since 1983 and will continue to keep them out of government for the indefinitely foreseeable future. That's the way you think. That's not the way we think. <coughs> Senator Foreman. Mr. President, uh, I direct my question to the Minister for Primary Industries and Energy, Senator Collins. As Senators would be aware, the Australian meat and livestock industries have now developed a significant trade in live sheep and carcass meat in the Middle East. A point of concern has been the difficulties that have existed in terms of live sheep trade into the Saudi Arabian market. Can the Minister advise the Senate of progress in industry and government negotiations to have trade recommenced? The Minister for Primary Industry and Energy, Senator Collins. Mr President, uh, I'm pleased uh, to announce that Australia is to recommence the live sheep trade with Saudi Arabia. This is an important development 
and one that's going to be welcomed by the Australian industry. I certainly know that my colleague, the Minister for Trade, uh, Senator McMullen, is also very pleased to see this matter finally resolved. The position follows what has been a very protracted period of discussion between uh, the Australian government uh, and industry and our Saudi counterparts. Over the last uh, few months, our ambassador in Saudi has had a series of meetings with the Acting Minister for Agriculture and Water, the Deputy Minister and other key officials regarding the Saudi requirement for the importation of Australian live sheep. A clear understanding now exists of those requirements. The Australian industry is confident that it will be able to supply live sheep in full compliance with the tight conditions that have been established. This is the, the first shipment, in fact, is likely to occur early next month. Mr. President, uh, these conditions include uh, strict age requirements, direct shipment to Saudi and the presence of a certified veterinary officer with each shipment. The decision to reopen this trade is a further economic boost to the rural sector, which is of course still struggling with the severe impacts of the drought. The Middle East meat and livestock trade was valued at about $300 million last year, and this included, importantly, $140 million worth of chilled and frozen sheep meat products. The access to the premium Saudi live sheep market will potentially add another $20 million to the Middle East trade per year. Mr President, the Australian Government welcomes this significant development that will further build on our already strong bilateral trading relationship with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. It's yet another example of how the Government is working with Australian industry to build a stronger, more diversified and competitive rural sector. Mr President, the industry, the Government, uh, will continue to closely monitor this trade to ensure that its long-term development and stability is guaranteed. Senator Kerno. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for the Environment and concerns his attitude to the powers of approval he has over projects with environmental impacts, uh, projects like uh, wood chipping and coastal developments. It was reported in the Sydney Morning Herald this morning, Minister, that you have a submission before Cabinet on the use of the Environmental Protection Impact of Proposals Act, which has as an option to effectively exempt from environmental assessment all projects that are currently in existence, including those projects that are having a significant effect on the environment. And I ask, if you were really to put that position, Minister, does it mean effective abandonment of environmental concerns in approvals for wood chipping licences? And will a similar attitude prevail toward developments for which you have responsibility under other acts, such as a project at Port Hinchinbrook in North Queensland? The Minister for Environment, Senator Faulkner. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, naturally, I have seen the article in the Sydney Morning Herald to, uh, uh, on which Senator Curnow has based uh, this particular question. I think about the only thing that uh, is correct in uh, that particular article is the statement that this government does have a strong stand on environmental issues. While I don't intend uh, today to preempt uh, Cabinet's discussion on this issue, I do feel that it's important to correct uh, those very misleading reports and allegations about uh, proposed amendments to the administrative procedures under the Environment Protection Impact of Proposals Act. Let me say straight up, Mr. President, that uh, any changes, any amendments to the administrative procedures will not affect the objectives of the Act. The administrative procedures are subsidiary instruments and they can only give effect to the object of the principal Act. I am not proposing any amendments to the Act itself. This Act, in fact, is one of the centrepieces of the Commonwealth's environment protection legislation. There is no way that I would put forward any proposal that would undermine the Act in any way. The object of the Environment Protection Impact of Proposals Act is to see environmentally significant projects assessed, but assessed only once, unless, of course, uh, Senator, there is an environmentally significant change in circumstances. And uh, what I'm responding to here is the uncertainty that was created by the Guns decision about the application of the Act uh, to ongoing operational decisions. For example, one of the potential consequences is that each individual coal shipment from a coal mine that's been assessed under the Act 
needs to be designated and reassessed. And I think nearly everyone, nearly everyone, would accept that that's undesirable, that it's unworkable, and that it's not consistent with the government's understanding and interpretation of the Act. It's also, Senator, just contrary to plain, good, old-fashioned common sense. Now, Mr. President, since the Guns decision, the government has overcome these potential operational uh, difficulties through issue issuing short-term individual exemptions for decisions relating to export approvals. Uh, this also is clearly not a satisfactory longer-term re uh, remedy. Mr President, the amendments to the administrative procedures which I am proposing will provide a more uh, satisfactory working arrangement and will restore the government's previous understanding of the intent and the scope of this Act. Of course, uh, senators would also be aware that there is a full-scale review of the Act that is currently underway. The Act has been in place now for over 20 years, Mr President, and it needs to be brought up to date. The EPA has released a discussion paper which is focused and, uh, on the base and formed uh, uh, the basis of a public uh, consultation process and that finishes at the end of this month. There are a number of uh, fundamental issues relating to environmental legislation being considered by that review. I don't uh, propose that the government will make any decisions which might preempt the outcome of the review process. And it's not my intention, Mr. President, having said those things, the which puts the government's position clearly on record, to make any more comment prior to the cabinet decision. Supplementary, Senator Kerno. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, Minister. Then, on the last part of my question, which relates to Port Hinchinbrook, are you currently finalising terms of reference for the study assessing the impact on world heritage values of the next three steps of the Port Hinchinbrook project? And considering what you said then about assessing things only once, will those terms of reference look at all the cumulative environmental impacts of the entire proposal over time, not just each step in isolation, and the same with the aesthetic impacts, over time, cumulative, not each step in isolation, in the way you're talking about um, a coal shipments, which I understand? The Minister, Senator Faulkner. Oh, thank you, Mr President. Well, in relation to that uh, aspect of Senator uh, Kerno's question. On the 22nd of February, I did meet with the developer, Mr. Uh, Williams. Officers of my department have also uh, met with the developer, Mr. Williams, of, from Oyster Point. Uh, through those meetings, he has been made very well aware of the Commonwealth's position in regard to the proposed development. On the 23rd of February, we received from the developer a request for consent to undertake a range of works on the site, including a breakwater, uh, dredging of an access channel and matters pertaining to the foreshore and foreshore management uh, plan. Currently, Mr President, that, uh, that request is being uh, evaluated. I have made it uh, clear to him uh, and all the other interested parties that my responsibility with regard to this uh, development is to assure that it doesn't damage the values of the adjacent World Heritage Area. The evaluation of, uh, of, the evaluation of any requests uh, for consent will bear this uh, in mind, and, uh, and we will look at uh, all those issues. We will look at uh, all those issues concurrently. Senator Shamaret. Thank you. My question is directed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, and I ask. When did former Indonesian General Sintong Panjaitan arrive in Australia, and when is he due to leave? On what basis was the former general granted entry to Australia? And three, how does the government reconcile its high international stand on human rights with their sponsorship of a visit by this general who was so closely linked with the Dili massacre in East Timor in November 91? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Evans. Mr President, Major General Panjaitan has been visiting Australia as a member of an advance party for the planned visit by the Indonesian Minister for Research and Technology, Habibi. He is now Deputy for the Armed Forces Affairs, for Armed Forces Affairs in the Agency for the Assessment and Application of Technology within Minister Habibi's portfolio. And it was, of course, in that context uh, that he was visiting Australia. 
Major General Pajaita was the commander of the 9th Military District in 1991, who did have overall responsibility for East Timor, but he wasn't in East Timor at the time of the Dili killings on the 12th of November, and there's no evidence that he was personally culpable or responsible in any way for giving the orders in question. There is no doubt that he was held uh, responsible in the sense that he had to assume the commander's responsibility for the acts of those subordinate to him, which responsibility he, he did accept and stood down or was forced to resign from the position in the armed forces that he had previously held. But there's an important moral distinction, I think, between the nature of the uh, behaviour or the responsibility of someone who was personally involved and was in that sense culpable and someone who is essentially formally responsible. And the government certainly had that distinction in mind in deciding, after careful consideration, not to uh, object to his presence in Australia. I hope it will be seen uh, in that context and not in any way as the government uh, being prepared to acknowledge that uh, somehow the events of Dili uh, were less serious than we previously said or the culpability of those directly involved was any less. I do make the point uh, finally, however, that uh, it's always been the government's position that a distinction was to be drawn between the events in Dili uh, and those, for example, in Tiananmen in uh, Beijing in 1989, because in the Chinese case what you clearly and unequivocally had was a deliberate act of state policy carried out at the direction and with the knowledge um, of those at the highest levels of government, as compared with the situation in Dili 91 which was uh, clearly aberrant, albeit grossly aberrant and outrageous behaviour by local military commanders. I don't have uh, to hand uh, any information as to the precise uh, date of his arrival in Australia or his intended departure, uh, but it was only a relatively short visit for the purpose of uh, setting in place arrangements for the long-awaited visit by Minister Habibi. Supplementary, Senator. Um, I think it's my understanding that he may have left yesterday, in which case I ask why didn't the government, as a good international citizen, take any action to collect the $14 million damages awarded by a United States court against Sintong Panjatan for the murder of a New Zealand citizen in the Dili massacre? And will the government refuse him a visa for a future visit to Australia? If not, why not? The Minister, Senator Evans. Well, as I understand it, there was a civil uh, liability that was uh, recorded in the American courts by way of default uh, judgment uh, in the absence of any uh, attempt by General Pajayatan or the Indonesian government to respond to that particular uh, plaint. Uh, executions of civil judgment are a matter for civilian plaintiffs to pursue through uh, proper process, and it's certainly no responsibility of uh, this government uh, to pursue that matter, even uh, had we um, some belief in a moral responsibility to do so, which, for all the reasons I've indicated, we don't. Senator Olson. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Leader of the Government. Is it a fact that the New South Wales branch of the ALP, already more than $10 million in debt, has been served or threatened with a notice of foreclosure by the Commonwealth yes. Bank unless it makes suitable arrangements to service the debt? What steps has the bank taken to achieve a reduction of the principal of this massive debt, or has it in fact blown out in recent weeks? Will the government obtain an assurance from the managing director of the Commonwealth Bank that the bank is not simply bankrolling a very politically privileged and technically insolvent debtor, and that ordinary Australians can expect the same sympathetic overdraft accommodation? Yeah, right. <coughs> the Minister of Mr. Well, President, this is not a matter for Evans. Commonwealth Government responsibility, my responsibility, the Prime Minister's or anyone else's, but let me nonetheless make the point that uh, there is a substantial mortgage uh, over the property in question uh, belonging to the New South Wales ALP. The New South Wales ALP is servicing the interest on this mortgage at $10,000 per month to the satisfaction of its bankers and auditors. And there is no substance, to my knowledge, in any suggestion that that debt is about to be called in or is in some other way being pursued in the way that's mentioned. It is, of course, uh, the case that the ALP lost a considerable amount of money on that particular transaction as a result of the collapse in the Sydney property market. Lots of people, uh, as a result of those uh, events, did lose uh, money in property investments and have been in some financial difficulties as a result. 
John Fay knows all about that. The Premier of New South Wales knows all about that because he's in charge of the state superannuation scheme, which has had a write-down of $1 billion as a result of the collapse of the Sydney property market in the early 1990s. And that is $1 billion of taxpayers' money that's been written down as a result Order. of that little exercise in property speculation. Order. $1 billion. $1 billion of taxpayers' money in New South Wales money was put at risk by the property investments of the state super scheme under John Fay. If you don't want to acknowledge any kind of responsibility or any inappropriate uh, behaviour on the part of the government instrumentality under John Fay in producing that debt, well, don't shed crocodile tears in here about the similar problems that the ALP got itself into as a result of exactly that, exactly that same situation. Order. Supplementary, Senator Olson. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I, I note that you simply say that the debt is being serviced. In other words, presumably the principal is not being reduced on a $10 million debt. I ask you further: How many Commonwealth Bank representatives attended the recent $2,000 a plate fundraiser for the ALP, and how much was contributed on behalf of bank shareholders to ALP funds? Has the ALP overdraft been considered by the board of the Commonwealth Bank? And if not, why not? And seeing you are interested in uh, state, state politics, can I simply ask you to answer the question so eloquently asked by Alan Ramsey last, last Saturday? And it was this: How do you convince the voters you know how to run the state if your own party is so demonstrably exposed as having mismanaged itself into insolvency? So, some, I must say some parts of, lunatic... of that question are very tenuously relevant to the minister's well, responsibility. What kind of a lunatic question it was? How many Commonwealth Senator. Bank shareholders, I'm asked? Have contributed to the ALP funds. Do you know how many Commonwealth Bank shareholders there are now? How many millions of Commonwealth Bank shareholders? Order. You point of order, order. Point of order. Point of order. order. Senator Alston. Obviously, the minister was just not wanting to hear the question. How many Commonwealth Bank That's representatives not, attended the recent two thousand dollar a plate fundraiser? Order. Senator and Alston. How much was contributed on behalf Senator of the bank Alston, shareholders? That's not a point of order. Well, it is, Mr. President. It's not a point of order. It's precisely on relevance. Be seated, Senator Alston. Be seated. It's not a point of order, and you well know it. Senator Evans. What's not a point of order? Uh, it is, you say I know that it was not a point of order. The fact is that Senator Evans himself would concede he was answering a question that he thought was related to how many Commonwealth Bank shareholders have contributed. It's not a point of order. It's not and a I'm point simply of order. saying on the question of relevance, my question was how much was contributed on behalf of shareholders. I would have thought that's a pretty simple proposition. It's not a point of order, and it's clearly not a point of order. Senator Distinction Evans. without a difference. How much was contributed on behalf of the millions of Commonwealth Bank shareholders? You goose, you wouldn't know the difference. The mortgage debt of the ALP is not $10 million, it's $6 million. The New South Wales ALP is committed to and will pay off every cent of the amount owing under the mortgage, capital and interest. We'll do this in close consultation with the order. branch as necessary with anyone else, and that's the way it'll be, and you can eat your rotten little heart out. Senator Neil. Order. Senator Neil. My question is to the Minister of Family Services, Senator Order. Crowley. We're talking about uh, childcare at the moment. Can the minister inform the Senate of the truth behind the New South Wales Premier's promise during his campaign launch to provide an extra 26,000 places under the national childcare strategy? Has the New South Wales government contacted the federal government about this issue? And given that the National Child Care Strategy is a joint funding agreement, Order. what does this mean for the Premier's promise? The Minister for Family Services, Senator Crowley. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Premier, uh, Mr. President. Like uh, anyone involved in child care, Order. anyone involved in child care, I was astounded at the Premier's announcement that he would actually provide an extra 26,000 child care places, because Premier Fay, Mr. Fay, knows knows full well. He's made a promise that he can't keep. He's made a promise that he can't keep. And he simply, he simply cannot provide those extra childcare places. And the reason comes from out of his own mouth. Mr. President, the, the Premier, Mr. Fay, said that um, the cost of these uh, 26,000 places, or the 22,000 that he's then uh, proposing to pay for, would be about $116 million in one year, and the liability for the state would be about $58 million. What this means is that 60 million of that liability would be the Commonwealth. 
So Premier Fay is making a promise to the New South Wales people that's contingent on this Commonwealth finding $60 million recurrent each year for childcare when he hasn't even signed the national childcare strategy for the last five years. So it's pretty, pretty bold of him to go around promising to spend Commonwealth money, $60 million of it recurrent each year, when he hasn't been prepared to sign the national childcare strategy for the last five years. It is very interesting. Very interesting indeed. Well, I'm very glad you interject, Senator McDonald, because the uh, Frank McGuire, Francis McGuire, Director of Community Child Care, a peak child care organisation in New South Wales, has uh, this to say about Mr Fay's promise. Order on both sides. Now that the Liberals are facing an election and realise that their track record for the provision of child care is really poor, they are beginning to make these outrageous claims. It's just appalling that the Liberal Party has made this announcement, knowing that the bulk of people aren't involved with the setting up of childcare places and that they can get away with it. They can make these statements of 26,000 places to be set up, and if they're not, it's the Commonwealth's fault and the people might believe them. I think that's criminal." End quote. Well, uh, I heard somebody interject over there, what's this got to do with the Commonwealth? Senator Macdonald, it's got everything to do with it. Premier Fay is not prepared to sign the Commonwealth State Child Care Strategy. He's not prepared to sign that strategy. He's certainly not contacted me about dubbing the number of child care places from 13,000 to 26 in one week. And he is doing this dependent and contingent upon finding Commonwealth recurrent money of $60 million. Mr Fay has made a number of blunders about child care. In fact, he had to backtrack and apologise for what he got wrong last week. But the idea of proposing 26,000 places, why, Senators? Because it's about to be something that matters to the people in New South Wales. They've been dudded of over 8,000 places over the last five years because the New South Wales government refused to fly, sign this strategy. Now, on the even election, he's not only promising uh, the, the heavens, but he's promising to spend $60 million Commonwealth recurrent each year. Now, that is uh, a promise he knows that he can't make. He's just not serious about it. He's ratted on the families in New South Wales and he's certainly betrayed the women. Senator Tierney. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate, uh, Senator Evans. Would the Minister explain to the Senate why crucial decisions on national issues have been delayed until after the 25th of March? And I refer specifically to the holding off of the inevitable next round of interest rate rises, the outrageous federal cabinet move to block the release of 33 forest areas for logging in New South Wales, singling out just New South Wales, and the delay in the planned massive increase in flights from 60 to 80 movements an hour at Sydney Airport. Isn't it the case, Minister, that your government has delayed and distorted public policy in this country just to help your mates in their attempt to win the New South Wales election. The Leader of the Government of the Senate. Senator well, Mr Redmond. President, that's an extremely vulgar suggestion from Senator Tierney, <laughs> and it's utterly without any foundation. I've already responded on the subject of interest rate rises. This is not a government that responds irresponsibly to the needs of this country for responsible economic management. If the Reserve Bank, in consultation with the government, decides that it's not appropriate to raise interest rates at this time, well then that's the decision of the Reserve Bank and that's one that we will readily accept. Because of course we would prefer that the economy is managed without uh, the need to go back to further interest rate rise. Of course, we'd all like to see any necessary policy adjustments being able to be managed by fiscal policy alone. That's been our position uh, for umpteen months, and that remains the position, irrespective of the transient uh, fortunes of the political timetable in, uh, in New South Wales. So far as the wood chips uh, decision is concerned, we made it clear some weeks ago that an extensive process of consultation was going to be necessary in order to make judgments about the status of those outstanding coops, and the timetable was Senator set weeks Tierney, ago this uh, to enable that process to properly take place. So far as New South Wales is concerned, it's already been explained to you in words of one syllable, and it needs to be in one syllable for you, Senator Tierney, that the particular coops that were not handed back in New South Wales 
were because there was simply insufficient information given to us by that government of yours in New South Wales, that brilliant government of yours, which was utterly incapable, or if not incapable, unwilling to give us the information on which we could make a reasonable judgment about the extent to which those values were in fact represented elsewhere in the state. If that information had been forthcoming in some credible or useful way from that incredible and useless government in New South Wales, it might have been possible for us to produce a decision much earlier. And that's the state of play in every one of the issues that you raise. There's no attempt to avoid dealing with these issues. We are a government that is is responsible, measured, balanced, sensible and credible in the way in which we approach these issues and will continue to be so. Senator Forshaw. Thank you, Mr President. My question... Order. Order. Senator For... Senator, For... Senator Forshaw, you have thank you. Thank you, Mr President. My question is directed to Senator McMullen, the Minister for Communications and the Arts, and I asked the uh, Minister, are media reports correct that New South Wales is in danger of losing the substantial investment in filmmaking facilities that have been proposed by Fox and were announced by the Prime Minister in Creative Nation? Mr Minister, if these reports are correct, what appears to be the problem and what is necessary to ensure that Australia realises the significant opportunities that would flow from this proposed investment. The Minister representing the Minister for Communications and Arts, Senator McMullen. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I am, of course, aware that the proposal to build an international film studio in Sydney, uh, initiated uh, not, of course, by the Fine Liberal government, they didn't have anything to do with starting the proposal, but by 20th Century Fox itself, is in some doubt. And as a consequence, there is a concern that uh, millions of dollars of investment in the film industry and all that that entails in terms of creative opportunities and infrastructure opportunities and job opportunities for uh, uh, Australians might be lost to Sydney. People will be interested in the history. Uh, the proposal was first announced in October last year by the Prime Minister in Creative Nation. And the Prime Minister said at that time that the Fox proposal would need to be discussed with the New South Wales State Government, which gave us some cause of apprehension as to whether it ever would ever go ahead, because nothing goes ahead once the hand of the New South Wales Government gets on it, which has ownership of the proposed site, the Sydney Showgrounds. Given the importance and significance of this proposal, the PM was quick to commit the Commonwealth Government to assisting with site development and preparation. It is interesting to hear twice to hear. Order. It's been interesting twice today to hear Liberal senators from New South Wales contend that there is sleazy deals involved in coming to an agreement of exactly the sort that Mr Kennett has proposed. I have to say I don't think, that is a re I don't think that's a reasonable criticism of Mr Kennett and, and nor of all Order. the other states who would love to have the opportunity to have this investment. But rather than grab this in initiative which the Commonwealth made possible, the Fay government decided not to negotiate with Fox but to invite tenders, com competitive expressions of interest, to implement an idea that somebody had come forward to them with. It is, in fact, a very difficult prospect for, a, for people who have been in opposition for a long time to understand, but obviously not one that originators of idea would be encour encouraged to come to a state for if all their ideas are going to be held up for tender so their competitors can come in and bid for their ideas. And obviously, Mr Kennett, understands that this is not a proposal that would be attractive to anybody wishing to make a serious investment and has come forward and sought to steal this project out from under the nose of New South Wales, putting at risk the possibility that Sydney and New South Wales might lose these significant employment, investment and creative opportunities. And uh, it's not a question of whether this is a terrible uh, Labor attack on the Liberals, because Mr Kennett is of course, an uh, equally enthusiastic uh, Liberal, but he is one who is putting forward this proposal, wanting to attract this proposal to Victoria. And it's not inconsistent with the experience of every minister who's ever had to deal with a proposal that requires cooperative proposals from a state. That's right. From Queensland, from Victoria, no from problems. South Australia, from Western Australia, from Tasmania, you can get interest and response and some sort of initiative that right. leads to a venture proceeding. But if it gets into New South That's Wales, right. nothing happens. What about regional New South Every Wales? Every time you get a proposal that requires any hand from the New South the Wales government, months, the proposal yes. stalls and stops there every occasion. And it is, in fact, 
it, hopeless. It is, in fact, exactly the same procedure I have found as Trade Minister. When Sorry. people are coming talking about investment proposals in Australia, they came to see us. They put forward a proposal that we wanted to go to New South Wales. We've had a much better proposal from Victoria. We're proposing to base our investment in Melbourne. And even as a, in the Commonwealth Government's own area of initiative, we sought proposals from New South Wales and Victoria about proposals we wanted to uh, spread between those two cities. The only serious proposal we got was from Melbourne, and we've had to commit ourselves to conduct that conference, the National Trade and Investment Outlook Conference in Melbourne, for the next five years because there was no effective interest from Sydney. <laughs> Senator Woods. Thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for School Education. Uh, the, the also ran uh, Senator Shot. Will the minister? I'm just quoting media sources here. Media sources. Will the minister rule out leaked finance department budget proposals, which would see an end to real growth in Commonwealth funding for non-government schools? And why is the government considering abandoning its election commitment? to increase funding to non-government schools and instead proposing to slash their funding by $220 million over the next four years. Senator Ray. Minister, you, Mr. Oh, Senator Ray. To the, uh, to Minister the representing the Minister for Employment, Education and Training. Senator the, the, Schott. Former, the former failed member for Lowe couldn't hold the seat. Uh, I just want to say is that obviously this question is motivated as part of your effort to help the New South Wales Liberal Party create a scare campaign. You know as well as I do, it is not the policy of the government to make any comment about speculation in whether on any area that may lead in the budget discussions. And that doesn't mean that these matters are being considered or not being considered. We just don't comment on them. And you know that as well as I do. Supplementary, Senator Woods. Since the uh, minister is clearly avoiding answering the question, and I ask you again: Will he actually rule out well, the proposal, which apparently has the approval of both Treasury and Finance? to cut the, uh, the Commonwealth funding for non-government schools. Will he admit that, if implemented, families with two children would actually have to pay more than $500 over the next four years, and then after that $300 a year? Uh, would this affect 900,000 students from 2,500 schools? And isn't this another example of how Labor's LAW really spells L-I-E? The Minister, Senator Shaw. Mr President, I'm astonished that the opposition could get up and complain about any suggestion of cutting an education expenditure. In the last election, they had proposal to cut billions of dollars of education expenditure. When, and it's interesting, the only, the, the only area you may be interested in uh, showing concern about is private schools. We are interested in the total education system of Australia, both public and private, and there will be good announcements made in the, on policy in this area, in the budget, and I'm just astonished that an opposition that keeps calling for expenditure cuts all over the place, particularly in the public sector, jumps up here saying that any suggestion, which are, which are in no way verified by the government, leads to your concern. It is just absolutely hypocritical on your part. Senator Calder. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is directed to Senator Evans, uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs, representing the, uh, the government and the Senate. The minister would be aware of the question I asked him last week of sitting regarding Australia's $6.6 million assistance to North Korea to build two nuclear power stations. Is the minister aware that, contrary to his assertion that solar energy is of little use in Korea, Solar Heart Australia is already selling between one and a half and two million dollars worth of solar hot water units into Korea? Is the minister aware that Solar Heart was negotiating on the very day I asked the question with, uh, with South Korea to build solar hot water units in that country? Is, is the minister aware that South Korea very sensibly levies fossil fuel sales and uses the money to subsidise the upfront capital costs of solar units? And finally, noting that the paltry $6 million provided in the 1993 budget has not resulted in a single uh, domestic solar hot water installation in Australia. Does the minister not think it is now time we followed South Korea's excellent example and provided real assistance to Australia's domestic and export solar industries rather than propping up foreign nuclear technology? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Evans. Mr President, I'm absolutely delighted to learn that Solar Heart has got a million and a half or two million dollars worth of sales into Korea and that it has the prospects for many more such sales. I don't doubt for a moment that there is a niche capacity. Uh, for that particular uh, very uh, sophisticated and effective enterprise to get into that particular market and on that kind of scale. 
the point about my answer to you last week, uh, whatever it was, Senator Coulter, is that you were suggesting that solar energy could be the answer in itself to North Korea's nuclear needs. And the point of the matter was that in order to generate the kind of power that's going to be produced by the two 1,000 megawatt stations that will be supplied under this negotiation to save us all from having bombs dropped upon us, you'll recall, uh, Senator Coulter, that, that, that in order to pay for the energy equivalent of that in solar energy, you'd have to spend something like $15 billion on solar heating appliances scattered around the landscape. And that, of course, is on the assumption that there's enough sunlight in North Korea to uh, play upon these installations in order to generate uh, the wattage that's, uh, that's, that's required. That was the point of my excursion, not to say that there's no market opportunity uh, for solar heaters at all in that environment. Of course there is. There is in every environment in the world almost a niche opportunity, but it can be no more than that when you're talking about satisfying the basic energy needs of the nation. So far as our $6 million or $5 million US contribution was concerned, what we're basically doing is demonstrating a commitment to the solution, which we hope has been successfully now negotiated, of the biggest single security problem we had in the entire region, a problem whereby North Korea was almost certainly engaged right now in the production of nuclear weapons with essentially unsafeguarded facilities in an environment where it was putting at risk not only the security of the Korean Peninsula but the whole region. It was desperately necessary to get a negotiated solution to that security problem. I think in a first-class feat of, uh, of diplomatic endurance the United States did negotiate uh, such an agreement with the North Koreans, the trade-off for which was that the North Koreans would be assisted with their energy production needs in the future on a transient uh, basis pending the construction of those uh, energy power plants. There was going to be uh, the supply of um, heavy fuel oil and Australia's contribution was to, uh, to assist to pay for that, but also, as I said, as, a, as essentially a symbolic contribution to the larger peace deal. Um, that was the only realistic uh, energy alternative available, as I understand it, that was acceptable to the North Koreans. The facilities in question will be uh, fully safeguarded. That's very much part of the uh, arrangement as well. And um, the whole result is one that ought to be applauded uh, by you wearing your peace hat, not uh, poured scorn upon by you wearing your sort of solar energy greenie hat, because your solar energy greenie hat just simply doesn't offer anything of any relevance. Uh, to the solution of the basic problem that we were trying to address. Supplementary, Supplementary question, uh, Mr. President. Uh, leaving aside the, the minister's naivety and his uh, faith in the NPT, uh, and just dealing with the solar energy, will the minister admit that he is totally misrepresenting the point? The, the cost of the two units uh, being built in North Korea is $4.5 billion. We are talking about $6.6 .6 million from Australia, and it would be very easy for Australia to uh, substitute that small amount with solar energy, as, it, as is already happening in South Korea, as I indicate, indicated in the question. The Minister, Senator Evans. Well, we didn't have any choice in the matter as to how our particular contribution would be spent. What the North Koreans wanted, what was negotiated in the deal, was a contribution to their um, transient energy needs which needed the supply of heavy fuel oil. We would much prefer uh, to have been able to supply uh, lighter fractions of petroleum which we can produce ourselves rather than simply paying for someone else's fuel to be supplied. But we weren't in there as an energy uh, policy exercise. We are in there as a peace exercise. And wearing your peace hat or your party's peace hat, surely you can see that. Yes, it does cost $4.5 billion. It's likely to cost that to produce these two light water reactors. But to produce the equivalent amount of energy through solar means, assuming the sunlight was available, would cost, as I said, $15 billion. That's the truth of the matter, so far as the energy economics of this are concerned. Senator Boswell. Thank you, Mr. President. I, my question is to Senator McMullen. I refer to the directions of the US government after the Uruguay Round resolution to use their export subsidy programs for market development for, and, for the example, I give recent subsidised dairy exports to Asia. An ABS conclusion in the US Farm Bill paper, and I quote, if the US subsidy programs are refocused on markets that are important for Australia, exports largely in Asia and the Pacific, many of the benefits from less distorted trade, which Australia could be reasonably expect from the Uruguay round, would be lost. 
In view of the great damage to our smaller industries like citrus, tobacco, chicken meat uh, on the Uruguay Round Resolution and the interest of the uh, least sustaining benefit for our large industries like wheat, beef and sugar, I ask, does the government agree with AB's assessments? And if their assessments should eventuate and the benefits are not there, what will be the government's response for both our small and large primary industries? Minister for Trade, Senator McMullen. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I am very surprised that I can't find the day when the National Party is uh, seeking to undermine the, the benefits that flow to the Australian agricultural industry from uh, uh, the uh, very important Uruguay Rail. <laughs> oh, you've upset him. You've point upset him. of order. My point of order is uh, truth, Mr. Pre uh, President. <laughs> and in no time have I ever undermined. The, oh, not the a, under, uh, no time have I ever mind oh, the not a point of primary order. industry. And Senator McMullen oh, well Senator, knows. There's not a point of order. Senator McMullen. Yes. That, that point of order, Mr Chairman, had at least had the advantage of being unique. Um, the, it is, of course, true, and it has always been true, and Senator Boswell and I have agreed about this in the past, that Australia is very concerned about the continuing subsidisation of exports by the United States and by Europe and, by, and the unfair impact that has upon free traders in agriculture, including uh, Australia. And, uh, we have had this year one unfortunate example already uh, with regard to the dairy industry. Of minor significance to Australia in itself in terms of the particular initiative that took place, but a worrying sign and one which we responded to, I think, in common uh, on all sides of this parliament. Uh, and the extent to which the United States seeks to uh, refocus uh, uh, their export enhancement programs and dairy, and other, uh, dairy equivalents uh, into market enhancement programs does create the potential for uh, that to intrude upon Australian markets. But we continue to have to make representations in support of and receive reassurances uh, from the United States about their commitment to seek to implement even these programs as newly focused in a manner which minimises the impact on, free, on fair traders in agriculture, in which of course they include Australia uh, and the Cairns Group countries. And we are continually in uh, liaison with the other members of the Cairns Group, uh, seeking to focus attention on the two things we can do that are positive, rather than just sitting back here expressing concern, fear and trembling. In the United States, it is about seeking to put maximum pressure on the Farm Bill. We have, I think, in 1995, a real opportunity to have a significant downward pressure on the subsidies within the Farm Bill. I would love to say that was because of the eloquence of the representations of the Cairns Group countries and others, but of course that's only peripheral. The core explanation is the budgetary problems in the United States. As they come to have to face up to the reality of their enormous budget deficit, they will have to realise they cannot continue to subsidise agriculture to the extent they do. And the evidence is starting to emerge. The evidence of the waste in that program, the evidence of the domestic impact of that program, the, the way in which so many of the already affluent receive the subsidies and those for whom the taxpayers think they are providing it do not. All those things are starting to become part of the public debate, and we have the new chairman of the Agriculture Committee in the Senate, Senator Lugar, making some uh, progressive comments in this regard. So it is something that every Australian uh, parliamentarian, every Australian citizen concerned with the public debate about trade and agricultural policy needs to be concerned about how these subsidies will be abused but the, or might be abused. But the key thing is, under the Uruguay Round, we have got agreement to reduce them and reduce them in the United States and even more importantly, and we shouldn't forget this, even more importantly, to see them reduced in Europe. And I think budgetary pressures in Europe and the United States will reinforce the impact of those Uruguay Round commitments and should, I think, lead to the fact that during the course of this uh, decade the opportunities for Australian exporters in dairy in other agricultural products should be significantly enhanced as a result of the Uruguay Round and we will continue to actively address those issues to seek to achieve that outcome. Senator Colston. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is directed to Senator McMullen, the Minister for Trade. I refer the Minister to a public a prediction by the Australian Rice Growers Cooperative 
that Australian farmers are aiming to capture half of Japan's 1995 rice import market. In this regard, can the Minister report to the Senate on the expected growth of the Japanese market for Australian rice growers and other primary producers as well? The Minister for Trade, Senator McMullen. Thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Colston for his question. Uh, in the Uruguay round, uh, we did have, amongst the other important initiatives that uh, I was able to outline in the response to Senator Boswell's uh, question, uh, an important commitment from the Japanese government to institute the graduated opening of Japan's uh, agricultural market, and particularly with regard to rice, in response to Senator Colston's question, although there were important uh, off-market opening opportunities in other products, which I'll hope to have time to comment on brief briefly. But we shouldn't underestimate the significance of that. The percentage figures are small, rising from 4 per cent of domestic consumption uh, in the base year period uh, in 1995 up to 8 per cent by the year 2000. But that means 380,000 tonnes of imported rice this year and 758,000 tonnes by the year 2000. Now, the rice, Australian rice growers and the Rice Growers Cooperative are understandably optimistic about winning a significant share of this because in the temporary market opening recently caused by the uh, 1993 uh, market pro crop problems in, the, in Japan, Australia's rice was very well received on the Japanese market. The type of the rice, the Japonica style and its uh, utilisation and uh, quality were very well received. And if the processes that are, imp are implemented to, uh, though instituted to implement this commitment, enable fair and uh, open competition for that uh, 380,000 tonnes uh, this year, I think Australia will win a very big share of it, and it's not excessive for our rice growers to think they might win half of it. It's certainly a very uh, reasonable uh, objective for them to set themselves, and they've been going about the promotion intelligently. Uh, a similar opportunity on a smaller scale uh, arises in Korea. And there are other agricultural market opportunities uh, in the market opening uh, if for, in Japan for Australia, in wheat, in barley and in dairy. And we're already starting to do well in some of those markets, and I think that opening, small as it is, and only a first step on what needs to be a much more substantial market opening, could be very, success, very important for Australian primary producers, will generate a lot of export income for Australia and a lot of income for many Australian towns. And I'd just like to say in conclusion, for all those who say, and there are some in the Senate, that there's a serious problem with the Uruguay round and we shouldn't have in entered into it, they should go to Leeton and explain to the rice growers why it's not a good idea that yeah, Australia yeah. signed up to the Uruguay yeah, round. Yeah, yeah. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Senator Crowley. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Senator Heron asked uh, the following question without notice on the 9th of March this year how much federal funding had gone towards the production of sexually explicit swap cards. I've been uh, provide with, provided with the following information, Senator. I'm advised that the Bubble Boy card series produced by the Queensland AIDS Council was funded by the Queensland Department of Health from the AIDS Matched Fund Program, known as the MFP. Under the National HIV AIDS Strategy, the Commonwealth allocates funds to the states and territories on a matched dollar-for-dollar -dollar basis for HIV AIDS activities. Funding is provided to the states under the MFP for education, prevention, treatment and care, training and evaluation activities conducted by state aid councils, AIDS councils and other non-government groups, as well as state-developed and administered HIV AIDS programs. Responsibility for allocating MFP funds rests with the relevant state health authority within the framework of the national HIV AIDS strategy. Senator Shamaret. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr President, under the order of the Senate relating to questions on notice agreed to on the 28th of September 1988, I ask the minister representing the Minister for Justice, Senator Balkus, for an explanation of why I have not received an answer to question number 1780, which I put on notice on the 18th of October 1994, to the Minister representing the Minister for Justice in relation to allegations concerning improper actions undertaken by Telecom. Is there a response from the. No, thank you. Well, I'm not quite there yet. You're, you're, uh... okay. Order. 
Earlier today, the temporary chairman of committee, Senator Colston, agreed to refer to me a ruling which he made concerning remarks by Senator Balkus about Senator Vanston. Senator Balkus said that Senator Vanston had produced something out of a brown paper envelope. Quote, Senator Vanston submitted that this remark raised an implication that she had improperly taken some action in return for a consideration and that the remark was therefore a personal reflection on her within the meaning of the Standing Order 193. Senator Colston said that he was unsure that the remark was unparliamentary and that he was unconvinced that there was a personal reflection intended, but he required the minister to withdraw the reference to Senator Vanston. Having read the Hansard transcript of the exchange, like Senator Colston, I am not convinced that the personal re reflection perceived by Senator Vanston either was intended or would be perceived by a reasonable listener to the debate. The chair has regard to the context to which the remarks are made, and having regard to the context of the remarks in question, it would appear that the expression brown paper envelope implied secrecy and lack of consultation rather than receipt of improper considerations. If a senator believes, however, that remarks constitute a personal reflection, the chair leans towards requiring, requiring withdrawal of the remarks, and that is what Senator Colston very properly did on this occasion. Are there any motions to take note of answers? So, I thought you'd finished with that issue. I'm sorry, Senator. I'm sorry for interrupting you then. Thank you. Senator Shamrock. Um, Mr. President, I, I wanted to move that the Senate take note of the explanation, or rather well, the lack of explanation, of the Minister. I haven't moved to, to that as yet. Uh, no. The, I, okay, fine. In, in response yeah. to the call okay, to order. Me. Um, uh, I, I made the call to order because I had um, requested uh, on notice an answer from the Minister uh, for Justice on 18 October 1994 um, in relation to allegations concerning improper actions undertaken by Telecom. And, uh, in response, uh, as uh, the Minister was leaving the chamber, he said to me, oh, um, uh, somebody from my office is going to ring your office and the question will be uh, forthcoming tomorrow, but I still pursued the call to order for the uh, reason that on the 6th of January 1994 uh, my office requested a response to that uh, question, which had been asked in, in October, and we were told that we would, uh, they would get back to us. One fortnight ago uh, the minister's office assured us that the answer was on the minister's desk, or some equivalent, I, I wouldn't want to misquote anybody on, on the accuracy of that, seeing it was patently inaccurate, uh, but that it was uh, forthcoming immediately, and that was a fortnight ago. So I don't see that his uh, chance remark to me on the way out of the chamber excuses the minister from his failure to give an answer within the 30-day uh, rule that we have in this place. And uh, I have no reason to believe his comment that I will receive it tomorrow any more than, of course, I believed the uh, comment a fortnight ago. I won't delay the Senate. I know uh, my other colleagues um, want to take note of answers, and, and I do myself. So I won't indulge in a 30-minute speech about the failure of the minister, but I do want to put on the record that uh, questions um, on, uh, on notice are one of the uh, few mechanisms available to people like myself in the chamber uh, who uh, don't get uh, the opportunity to gain this information from ministers uh, very often. And uh, we, we do deserve the respect to have that 30-day rule um, honoured. And uh, so I want to draw it to the attention of the minister. and, and uh, uh, move that the, the minister be censured for his failure to take seriously uh, the call to order on this day. The question is that the motion be agreed to, the motion to take note, that is, be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye, those against no. I think the ayes have it. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Short. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I uh, move that the Senate take note of Senator Evans' answer to my uh, question uh, earlier today on likely uh, interest rate and uh, tax uh, increases. Mr President, uh, during his uh, recent uh, overseas uh, jaunt, uh, Mr Keating uh, demeaned his position and uh, that of the Australian nation by disgracefully breaking the, uh, the long accepted convention of not pursuing uh, domestic political issues uh, whilst representing his country overseas including, and I'm sure no one will ever forget him elbowing aside 
the, pri the uh, Prime Minister of Singapore on the steps of the uh, Parliament House there to mount an attack on opposition leader John Howard. But when he wasn't, uh, when he wasn't so paranoically and uh, embarrassingly engaged, which of course was most of the time, he made himself look even more ridiculous by telling the Europeans how to run their economies, including Germany of all places, the strongest economy in the world, uh, telling them how to do business uh, with Asia, how even to uh, rebuild their cities uh, and how to reshape the, uh, the global power balance. Now, while Mr Keating was feeding uh, his, uh, his ego by strutting the world stage, I must say sounding uh, every decibel more like a dictator in the making, uh, the Australian economy uh, continued to plunge into further balance of payments deficit, the foreign debt continued to soar, and the Australian dollar plummeted against virtually all other currencies, including, of course, the Deutschmark, uh, the currency of the nation whose chancellor, uh, Mr Keating, had the arrogance to lecture on economic management. Uh, un unbelievable. And uh, today, when I, po when I pointed out uh, that the, uh, to the leader of the government in the Senate uh, that the fall in the Australian dollar and our chronic balance of payments problem made further uh, interest rate and tax increases inevitable unless the government uh, acts uh, uh, swiftly and surely uh, to put its budget house in order, uh, the Leader of the Government uh, refused even to comprehend that situation. Now, Mr uh, Deputy President, the simple fact is that the Government is attempting to sweep this inevitability under the carpet until after the New South Wales uh, uh, elections uh, next Saturday. And that is a quite disgraceful abrogation of the government's uh, responsibility uh, to manage the affairs of state uh, at the national level. It is almost exactly a repeat of what the Hawke government did, uh, you may recall, in 1988, uh, when the now, uh, when the, the now Prime Minister, uh, Mr Keating, was Treasurer, and when the, the uh, then New South Wales uh, Labor government uh, uh, under Premier uh, Barry Unsworth was uh, fighting, as it turned out, unsuccessfully uh, for survival. And the delays in taking uh, responsible action, economic action, at the federal level in 1988 uh, simply in a, in a uh, totally opportunistic uh, domestic political attempt uh, to save the skin of a, co of a colleague government uh, at the state level in New South Wales. The delays that were caused for that very reason and that very reason alone were the reasons uh, that led directly uh, to the Treasurer pulling on the recession that he said that we had to have, but which of course in, in reality was a recession we should never have had to have and should never have had uh, if there had been one ounce of economic uh, responsibility and, uh, and, uh, and acceptance of that responsibility. Uh, at the federal, uh, federal government level. We are seeing the same thing again uh, this year in the 1995 uh, election for the New South Wales government. I am absolutely certain that the result is going to be the same as in 1988. That is, the desperate attempts uh, by a Labor government in Canberra to save their Labor mates, and I use the word advisedly, uh, in New South Wales is going to be as unsuccessful in 1995 and deservedly so as it was in 1988. Order. Senator Troth. On the same matter, Senator Troth? Uh, uh, Senator Hill, uh, I, I actually had you on the list. Are you in respect to the same matter? The question is, Senator, take note of the Minister's answer. Those that opinion say aye, those who get say no, I think the ayes have it. Senator Hill. Mr. President, I move the Senate take note of um, Senator Evans' answer on Aboriginal affairs. Uh, and I do so because um, I'm sick and tired of the government resting on its laurels in relation to Aboriginal affairs, when in fact their record in this most sensitive portfolio is absolutely appalling. Now, if, ever, if there is ever an area of po public policy failure, Senator Reynolds, it has to be in relation to Aboriginal affairs. And you've only got to start. You've only got to start by looking at the facts. Look at the record of the Australian Bureau of Statistics as it put out in its recent census. Let's look at some of the figures for a moment. Unemployment rate 38 per cent. 
but if you take into account those who are working for the dole on Commonwealth unemployment programs, over 50, 54 per cent of Aboriginals are unemployed. 60 to 70 per cent of them are long-term unemployed. 50 per cent in the age group 15 to 19. Now, you might smile or laugh at this, but we actually think it's important. Look at income, for example. Aboriginals haven't got jobs. Six out of ten Aborigines in Australia is on an annual income of less than $12,000. Sixty per cent. Six out of ten. It's an appalling record. Uh, education. This government boasts about the record of school, uh, uh, of school uh, children that are staying to school to year 12. Well, I can tell you that of 17-year-old Aboriginal Australians, only 30 per cent of them are in any form of education at all. And look at health. Did you read Senator Reynolds the, the, what the census report said, that 29 per cent of Aboriginal Australians are concerned about where the next meal is coming, coming from? Did you read, in, in fact, that, uh, that uh, maternal death rates are eight times higher in the Aboriginal community than in the white community, that 30 per cent of Aborigines are affected by diabetes? that men aged between 25 and 35 are ten times more likely to die than the rest of the community, and so, someone, so we can go on. Have you looked at the figures in relation to Aboriginal housing, uh, Senator Reynolds? Have you seen that 40,000 Aborigines living in remote and rural Australia need housing and that one-third of the existing stock, 4,500 houses, are in poor repair and in need of major renovation? That 35,000 bedrooms are needed and 16,000 people need proper access to sewerage systems. How many times do you need to look at the facts before you recognise, in fact, that your government has failed in this vitally important and sensitive, uh, and sensitive um, area? And I could go on with, uh, with housing. 69 per cent, practically 70 per cent, are in some form of uh, rental, rental housing. Now, that's not bad in, it, in, in itself, but why are they treated differently than the rest of the Australian community? Mr Deputy President, in the critically important areas of Aboriginal health, Aboriginal, Aboriginal jobs, Aboriginal education, these areas where Aboriginal people have a right to expect more of this government, this government has failed them. And all we hear from the government are their boasts. I heard it on the radio over the weekend. We gave Australian Aborigines Mabo. This government didn't give them Mabo at all. Mabo was the decision of the High Court. It was the High Court. It was the High Court that decided that native title existed, not your, not your government at all. And as to the latest uh, land bill, well, that's, uh, we said that we'll support it. But the point is, the point is, it is easy for you to pass legislation to allocate public money in the purchase of an area where state governments have been doing it for years, and then boast of your achievements. But when you look at these critically important areas, health, education and jobs, it can only be said on any fair objective assessment that you have failed the Aboriginal community in this country, that your record in Aboriginal affairs is deplorable, and it's about time you faced up to your responsibility in that regard. Well, the question is, is Senator, Senator Reynolds on the same matter? Yes, on the, on the same matter. Senator Hill, I can understand why you're sensitive. I can understand why you feel that you've got to go through a litany a litany of, of uh, statistics. I don't suppose that anyone on this side of the chamber would try to make a claim that, that uh, the, the, this government has overcome all the very complex social issues facing Indigenous peoples. However, we have been prepared to tackle some of the major issues, the ideological issues, that you cannot come to grips with. You, you talk about our response to the High Court's decision, but of course it's quite clear that you could not deal with that issue. You were so divided, you couldn't deal with it in an open, fair-spirited way. You had to nitpick at every, tu at every turn, and you, had to con you have to continue with all issues affecting Indigenous people to be very grudging in your approach. Here we have. Here we actually have today, when we should be debating the Racial um, Hatred Bill, we have a debate that goes on this morning while you again refuse to deal with the issues. Now, I, I will debate you any day about, about the fundamentals in relation to health, health, housing, employment and education. But if you look at the statistics, 
of your, your administration or in the uh, 1970s. Senator Reynolds, I want to just invite you to address your remarks through the chair as well as to the opposition. Yes, thank you, uh, thank you uh, Mr. Mr Deputy President. I'm glad you reminded me of that. But uh, I, do think it, I do think it is important that we try in this place to get some cross-party approach to, to race issues and to Indigenous issues in particular. It, I find it very distressing that uh, the, uh, the opposition loses no opportunity to try to point score and politicise what is a fundamental issue for this, this nation. And Senator Hill talks about our reputation, but Senator Hill, you're someone who travels extensively, and I understand, I understand that it is quite uh, common, certainly when I travel, for people to compliment the Australian people, compliment the Australian government on the changes that have been being made in Indigenous policy in this country. There have been a number of people, particularly from Canada, uh, from the United States, who are extremely impressed with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission and the way it operates. And yet all we ever hear in this place is criticism of, of uh, the Commission. And, uh, well, well you, may not be, you may not be you may not be criticizing on this occasion. But you are frequently, and members of the opposition are always criticising the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission. You lose no opportunity to try to take Indigenous people to task. When, when we have, when we have uh, issues in other areas of government where funds have not necessarily been spent as uh, effectively as they should, do we hear from the opposition? No, we don't. We only ever hear from the opposition. We, do, we, we only ever hear from the opposition when they want to attack Indigenous people, and you don't hear. Well, and let's let's look at let's look at, at what happened in the Hindmarsh Island circumstance. Did we get a, gener, a, a spirit of generosity from Ian McLaughlin? No. He finally had to resign because he was obliged to resign. He saw that that was necessary. So, Senator Hill, I don't think you're in any position to lecture this government until you get your own policies in order. We don't know what your policies are, and, and we don't know what your commitment to Indigenous people are. You're, you're continually resentful and resisting in your approach to Indigenous issues, and I think it's about time. It's, a, it's about time that you put your policies on the table, and then we might be able to make a judgment. Uh, or, 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 um, on the same matter, Senator Evans. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President. I wanted to address a few remarks to uh, Senator Gareth Evans' response to the question on the native title legislation as well, because I think it is uh, of concern that the uh, response made by the Liberal Party to the High Court decision the other day, and I think it has been highlighted by Senator Hill's contribution today, which I uh, take as a rerun of the Mark II position on the land fund, which was to talk about amendments that go to questions of education, health, housing, etc. I think that was the Downer position, as different from the Hewson position, as different from the Howard, uh, Howard position which is now to claim that the legislation is unworkable. And, uh, and I think this really, uh, really shows the total disarray that the Liberal Party has in relation to, uh, to Aboriginal issues. The High Court found uh, the other day that the West Australian legislation was invalid, and they ruled 7-0 on that issue. So it's quite clear that the Commerce legislation has been upheld, and the West Australian legislation was to be found, found to be invalid and, uh, is, in my view, essentially racist. Now, the Liberal Party has to come to terms with that. They cannot continue to bow to the Liberal rednecks in Western Australia who want to pretend it never happened. The fact is the Mabo decision did happen. The fact is the federal parliament did respond, did legislate in accordance with that, with that decision. And the High Court have now removed any uncertainty about our our legislation's constitutional validity and have ruled invalid the racist attempt by the West Australian Government to take away those rights to native title enjoyed by West Australian Aboriginal people. But the worrying aspect is not that, that Richard Court continues to oppose the legislation and continues his fight. I guess he has no option. 
he's committed himself so far down the track that he really can't turn back, although it's obviously at uh, severe risk to his credibility now when the $10 million of taxpayers' money in West Australia has been wasted on this futile uh, attempt to overturn the native title legislation. But the really worrying thing is, is the remarks made by John Howard in commenting on the decision following court's comments. He claimed also that the legislation was unworkable in WA. He's provided no evidence for that assertion. He's provided uh, no basis for that, but he is trying to respond to the, uh, to the uh, redneck elements from the Liberal Party in Western Australia who wish to argue it's unworkable in WA. Now, they don't say what's different about Western Australia other than the fact that we have more mining, mining uh, leases than any other state. And that's quite true. We do have a large amount of mining activity. But the principles that underline the bill are just as capable of working in West Australia as they are in any other, any other uh, state. And for John Howard to have this knee-jerk reaction that the legislation is unworkable just shows the total disarray on, liberal, on the Liberal side on the questions of Aboriginal land and native title. They are so much out of touch that uh, is reflected in an in a article in today's uh, Australian in which the chief of the CRA, well-known friends of the Labor Party and the trade union movement, has hailed Mabo as an opportunity for partnership. And I quote, in a speech representing a sea change in attitudes at CRA, long regarded as hard line, and praising the Prime Minister, Mr Keating, Mr Leon Davis said yesterday he was satisfied with the central tenant of the Act. Mr Davis said it laid the basis for better exploration access and then thus increased the probability that the next decade will see a series of CRA operations developed in active partnership with Aboriginal people. End of quote. So the Liberal Party is not reflecting even the views of the mining industry in its continued opposition to, to uh, the native title legislation. You've got CRA, one of the biggest miners and explorers in Western Australia, indicating its support for the basic principles of the Native Title Act. You are all alone clinging to support Richard Court, who was wrong, has been proved to be wrong 7-0, and he can't accept the political defeat. What the, High Court, what the High Court has done is uphold our legislation and has uphold the opportunities that are existent in the Act to, to make the system work. And what I think uh, Richard Court and the Liberal Party are better off doing is looking at those problems that they say exist and using the mechanisms that already exist in the native title legislation to establish state bodies, state tribunals to deal with applications and, and to uh, look at the question of the right to negotiate regime and look at the possibilities for exclusion from some of those things. There are opportunities in the native title legislation that can be adopted and can be usefully used in Western Australia with a constructive approach. And John Howard should not go the same way as Alexander Downer did in bowing to hardline liberal right-wing attitudes, he brought about the downfall of his own leadership, and the same will happen to John Howard unless he changes his view on this legislation. Well, the question is that, uh, the question is that the Senate take note of that answer. Those that opinion say, oh, those again say, no, I think the eyes have it. What am I, what am I, with my delicate sensitivity, make the observation that the expression racist in respect to a political party is probably acceptable in terms of it being a description of a government is less acceptable. It is certainly not acceptable in terms of individual members of any party, whether they be the Premier or anybody else. Senator Troth. Thank you, Mr. Mr Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of the answer given by Rosemary Crowley, um, Senator, so sorry, Senator Crowley um, in regard to childcare in New South Wales. And um, if Senator Crowley is, is not aware that after extensive negotiations that the New South Wales government signed off or agreed to the expanded national childcare strategy on the 3rd of February 1995, then she is um, not managing her department well. She knows very well that there was in principle agreement by the federal government and the state government to the terms in the strategy at an officer level. Now, Rose, Senator Crowley has yet to sign the agreement, has yet to officially sign the agreement, and she is the one who is at fault in the type of political storm that she has tried to whip up today. And indeed, I concur with the comments of the New South Wales Minister for Community Service, Mr Jim Longley, who has accused the federal Labor government of deliberately delaying the implementation of the expanded national childcare strategy as a blatant political stunt. 
Now, Senator Crowley has long been critical of the New South Wales government for not previously signing the agreement, and it does seem strange now that the state has finally forced the government to make concessions, only weeks before the state election, in which Labor is not looking good, that Senator Crowley is now holding off signing the agreement. And one would almost um, be led to the conclusion that she is more concerned with playing political games with her state counterparts than actually being concerned about childcare places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The New South Wales government had not previously signed the agreement because they were not convinced that the strategy was in the best interest of children or their parents. And they were particularly concerned that the Commonwealth's emphasis on childcare for children with working families did not adequately address the needs of vulnerable children. Now, finally, New South Wales accepted the Commonwealth's offer of additional childcare places after three points were conceded. New places for disadvantaged families, which Labor was not prepared to fund under the previous guidelines. When the Commonwealth finally ensured that administrative agreements were streamlined, which reduced bureaucratic delays and when long daycare places were added into preschools, which is surely making the best use of resources. Now, in negotiating for those concessions, the New South Wales government was not being obstreperous. It had simply taken great pains to work out an agreement that appropriately addressed the needs of New South Wales families and ensured a high standard of care for children. The concern with affordability, flexibility and accessibility is not something the Commonwealth Government on, has a very good track record on. And I might just refresh the government's memory of a number of reports which came out last year and chronicled the problems with the Commonwealth's childcare program, such as insufficient baby places, insufficient childcare places in rural areas, the cost of childcare, a lack of, a lack of flexibility in care arrangements and so on. Parents continually complain about the lack of places, long waiting lists and unsuitable opening hours for centre-based care. Now, of course Senator Crowley is going to make these comments in the run-up to the New South Wales election. What needs to be borne in mind is the fragmentation and the administrative chaos of the Commonwealth programs compared to the constructive policies of the Fay government, which will, which will provide an integrated childcare program so necessary to the needs of the modern family. What are the questions the Senate, on, the, on the same matter, Senator West? Uh, Mr Deputy President, I've heard many apologies in this place in various guises, but this is the best one I've ever heard apologising for New South Wales taking just on five years to sign the National Child Care Agreement. That means that 8,000 places in New South Wales have been wanting, have been not available to families in New South Wales for five years. And somebody in the opposition stands up and has to apologise. No wonder people in New South Wales are concerned about what this current Mr Fay's government is doing, when that's the sort of thing. We hear Senator Troth talk about the problems with long waiting lists. Well, there wouldn't be such long waiting lists in New South Wales if they'd signed the agreement some time ago when it had first been discussed and first been put on the table. But it takes New South Wales to the eve of an election where they look like losing before they actually decide they have to do something for the family of new families with children in New South Wales. I would suggest that Senator Troth would be well advised to go and talk to families in New South Wales, to go and talk to rural families about the preschool needs of children in those areas and how they cannot get preschools out to those places. You want to talk about childcare and preschool needs. What about asking the parents who can't get their children on the distance education preschool because the New South Wales government will only fund them for about 70 odd places? 70 odd places in distance education preschool to cover the whole of New South Wales? You have to be joking. They have crazy rules that people in places such as Wanaring, where there might only be one child of preschool age, because they live in a settled area, aren't able to have access to distance education preschool, which is the same as the school of the air. 
So New South Wales, in fact, has been discriminating against people, particularly in rural areas with families, for a long time on the issue of childcare and children's services. We wouldn't want for them to discuss also the issue of um, accommodation for the disabled in New South Wales, but that's not something in this answer. We here are talking about childcare and children's services in New South Wales. What the Fay government, the Fay Murray, Fay Armstrong government have done is just to totally neglect and disregard the needs of rural families in particular, but the childcare needs of people in those areas. In Broken Hill, they should go and talk to the occasional care centre there that has been trying to get extra funding out of the state government so that they can run an occasional care centre. They should go up to Wee War and talk to the mothers and the families out there who are trying, who this year have a mobile preschool running because they have a rural access program, a women's access program grant, and next year the state government is not going to provide them with anything. These are the sorts of issues and the sorts of things that the people in New South Wales are having to put up with. We also had, as I say, we had nothing from, heard nothing from the federal, from the state government, for four years in excess on this issue. Four years it went on for, and they did nothing. Deprived at least about 8,000 places, people with access to about 8,000 places. Now I couldn't live with that on my conscience, but obviously Mr. Fay is suddenly having an attack of conscience now when we're. Sort of, we started off when we were about five weeks out from the election, um, and we've had a few headlines since then. But of course, why does it take them four years or five years? Because it's now gone into 1995. Why has it taken them so long? They've come up with a number of feeble excuses. Oh, we wanted to get a better deal because we've waited. We've got a better deal. What about the families who have been discriminated against? What about those who have been unable to find the care for their children that they have needed in the past four years? They have been totally ignored and totally neglected. And that's the sort of thing that a coalition government would do federally. And what we've seen, we know, we have the example of what they do when they're in a coalition government in the state. This is the sort of thing that people will be opposing and voting against next Saturday. But it's interesting. We have not heard anything from the opposition on this matter, but obviously today, by today's performance in the chamber there is an election coming up in New South Wales. The opposition are very concerned about what the result is going to be, and it's pretty clear that there's going to be a change of government. This sort of thing is just highlights to us just how, how um, very seriously concerned the, uh, the current Liberal government in New South Wales is when they have to suddenly, after five years, decide they're going to sign agreements. I think it's an abysmal shame and a, a disgrace that it would take a government five years to do something and it would deprive 8,000 families of ac or more of access to childcare which they desperately need. Order. The question is that the Senate take note on the same matter. I, I would like to. Um have a, say a few so, words I, I, on the issue of child I apologize. I have I the call, and I think you order, might give me the courtesy of respecting that. Order, Senator, Senator Neil, I apologise. I, if, there's a, if there's a speaker on the other side, if, with your indulgence, I, I must call them. I didn't understand there was. In fact, I was so concerned because Senator Chamaret was, was to take the call for the next question, and I was preoccupied with that. But if there's a call on the same matter, uh, I have called you, Senator Neil, if you insist you're entitled to take the call, but um, I, I, in fact, am in, would, under normal circumstances, call somebody from the left. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Se President. If Senator ever the Bates. people of New South Wales needed a reason why they should not be voting Labor at the next election, it is the contribution that we have just heard from Senator West. The simple fact is, as Senator Troth has so properly pointed out, the Fay government signed the appropriate agreement in early February. Something, sorry? Yes. They, signed, they signed off on that agreement. They signed off on that agreement. They, they signed off on the agreement. Order, order, order. Senator Neil, it's most unlike you to be des describing the comments of one of your colleagues on the other side as telling lies. I'd, I'd feel more comfortable if you'd, if you'd uh, withdraw that. Se Senator, Senator Ray. We on this side have always taken a very consistent attitude to that point you have raised, and uh, I'm sure Senator Neil will uh, 
in uh, the fullness of time, in fact after I finish speaking, withdraw uh, that particular comment. Uh, and uh, yes. What I actually said was that what he had said. What? Just would you mind actually listening? If you shut up and show order, some order, courtesy, order. I will withdraw. Order, order, Senator Neal. Senator Neal, as an inexperienced deputy president, I could get easy to get the impression that you and Senator Ray are taking up the time that's left, which is uh, running down very quickly. I'm asking you to withdraw. I, I will withdraw Thank any you. statement, S S S any S statement that they were liars. But what I said was what they were saying was not correct. Senator Neal, the, the, the time for this debate has uh, has expired. I put the question that. Um, that the Senate take note of the Minister's answer. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no aye. I think the ayes have it. Presentation of the documents.